Oh, I don't need to say yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, here we go now, for real. So uh, welcome everybody to the 130 presentation, Solventless Extraction Strategies for Success. Um, if you haven't already done so, please silence your cell phone so that we're not hearing those. Uh, I am Shea Golos, host of the Shaping Fire podcast. If you like listening to smart interviews with the top minds in cannabis, I invite you to check out the show at shapingfire.com. We also have an extraordinary YouTube channel with over 150 speaker videos I've recorded at events just like this one. In fact, Eric Vlosky, one of our speakers, already appears on the channel teaching about rosin tech. Uh, Josh Rutherford is one of the founders of Pure Pressure, as well as owner of Kush Masters, an award-winning processing lab based in Boulder, Colorado. Eric Vlosky is director of marketing for Pure Pressure, and the two of them operate Pure Pressure, the industry-leading solventless equipment supplier. So please welcome Josh and Eric. Thank you. Awesome, thank you all for coming. We appreciate your time. Uh, we've got a really good seminar here to empower anyone, either if you have an existing business that's running solventless and you're looking for tips and tricks on how to make it better, or if it's a form of extraction that you're looking to get into, either as a complete net new, or as one that you're gonna be adding on to an existing operation. So the whole point of this presentation is to give people advice, tips, and strategies so that you can be successful with solventless. It's one of the extraction forms that needs the most education, and that's what we're here for. So Josh and I will be you know, tag teaming these topics. Uh, we've got a lot of great ideas to share with you guys, and we're gonna go through this presentation in a cadence kind of leading you through how to really think about being successful with solventless processing because there are a lot of elements to it that if you're not really orienting your business in the right way, you can make some missteps, you can stumble, and it'll make it a little more difficult for you to do so. So we're here to help anyone who's trying to do solventless do it right. So the first big point is in today's market with concentrates, if you are not making solventless concentrates, you do not have a premium extraction brand. And a lot of our customers, solventless might be 5% of their business. Some of our customers, it's 100% of their business. But if you are trying to make concentrates, solventless is the way that you attract influencers and connoisseurs, because that's really the product category that that specific segment of the market is looking for. Now, we go to tons of trade shows, we talk to business owners, I mean, business owners of CO2 companies, hydrocarbon companies, those guys that are owning and running those companies are smoking rosin. That's what they tell us. In, Absolutely. In, in secret. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's the clean concentrate as well, you know, the solventless concentrates, it's also fetching the highest dollar. You have a variation of skews that you're able to create with rosin, with bubble hash, and really escalate what you guys are doing, whether it's an existing lab or trying to start just a solventless lab or having a solvent and solventless lab. So it's really, really important um, to be able to have, and we'll get into this a little bit later, is a variations of SKUs. And solventless can bring you that, and you know, it's uh, definitely one of the cleanest concentrate forms that I, I enjoy smoking the most. Yeah, so another quick note here is that many of our customers are doing all kinds of forms of extraction, and, and most labs should be. So that is the perfect segue. Uh, I don't know if anybody checks out MJ Biz. They put out a fact book every year. They update it. We are not affiliated with them in any way. I'm not a salesperson for MJ Biz, but their fact book provides some of the best data in the industry. And if you're serious about learning where trends are, totally recommend it. And that's where this slide's coming from. I know the resolution isn't very good. But what this very complicated set of bars and numbers is trying to tell us is that the profitability of processing operations increases dramatically when you're making a number of SKUs. So for processing operations that are making one to three different products, only six of them are reporting that they're profitable. That is very, very little. Now you get into four to six, 20%, but then once you get to that bottom, what that's really saying is that processing labs that are making between 11 and 15 unique SKUs, unique products, 83% of them are reporting profitability. That is a massive gulf in the difference of how many yeah. products these labs are making and their profitability as a result. Yeah, and the reason you, know, you kind of see that trend in the industry is because we're in a limited market. 
you know, wherever you're opening up, whether it's Colorado, whether it's, you know, Illinois or California, you know, there's only so many dispensary licenses. So being able to capture more SKUs, more volume with each of those stores and have a bigger presence in those stores is very important in order to be the most successful with your solventless business or solvent business. And most importantly, solventless is the least expensive way to add additional SKUs. Uh, when you compare cost, you know, for the equipment, for everything that you need to go in on to actually release a number of solventless SKUs, solventless tends to be the least expensive of all of them. So it's the easiest way, the cheapest way to add additional SKUs to your product mix if you aren't already doing so. Yeah, and it's all about the post process. It says post process that you're actually using to make those SKUs. So whether it's going to be topicals, edibles, uh, carts, you know, raws and batter, um, there's a bunch of different jams and uh, micro diamonds, all sorts of different things. Each one of these can be a SKU for your business to be selling. And then what it's gonna come down to is also the material that you're able to uh, source or grow. So that's also something that we're gonna get into here down the line. Yep, absolutely. So helps you attract more consumers. There are consumers in the market, and I'm sure uh, a number of them in this room right now, that you probably will pretty much only smoke solventless or maybe really good live resin. But the high end, the connoisseur, the influencer consumers, this is the product that they're looking for. And if your lab isn't producing it, then you're not even competing in that market in the first place. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the different types of products that we see as the most popular, that are being sold the most. And right now, really, hash rosin has risen over the last couple years to be pretty much the dominant solventless product uh, in terms of quality, in terms of volume being sold at dispensaries. So Josh, you know, running Cushmasters and making a lot of you know, hydrocarbon solventless, he makes a whole variety of products, not just solventless, this is what you've been seeing, right? Oh yeah, it's definitely the industry trend. Um, and like we were, I was just mentioning, you know, there's many different consistencies that you can make off of your solventless concentrates. So it's really off of the post-processing and actually maximizing and using industry-specific equipment so that you're optimizing your solventless venture because you don't want to leave two, three percent behind and you know end up you know not having the extra that you could have that is going to actually make your business viable. Yep. And we're going to talk about food grade solventless and kind of dispelling the myth of how to get a better yield out of your product. Uh, with hash rosin specifically, you're seeing that people are really developing a taste for live rosin products, just like live rosin coming from fresh frozen plants. That terpene profile and for a whole variety of other business reasons labor, time, there's all these reasons that companies are doing live products and live rosin is pretty much the, the king right now in terms of high-end dabbable concentrates. Now, Full Melt, Six Star is also starting to make a comeback. A lot of the people that have you know been enjoying hash for a long time, it's a pretty unparalleled ex experience to get great Full Melt. Now more and more places are trying hard to produce Full Melt. Um, Bricked Hash is making a comeback as well. Uh, we, we are seeing some really cool ice water hash products. And not to leave SIFT out of this, there's a lot of companies also making really great SIFT rosin. Um, flower rosin, however, is a product that we're not seeing as much of in mature markets like Colorado. In newer markets, it's easy to produce. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of it there, but as markets tend to mature, we're seeing a little bit less consumption of flower rosin. Yeah, and we can kind of talk a little bit about that and why you kind of see those trends. So those trends are also because of the price point of the flower compared to in that relative market. So, you know, for example, on the East Coast, I mean, I'm sure pounds of flour on the recreational and medical market are still going for 3000 plus, where here in Colorado, they're 2000 and below. Um, so you'll start to see those trends and those shifts within those can cannabis businesses and those MIPS. So those MIPS were basically going to be able to create different SKUs and varieties based on the price points that are able to start sourcing material. Yep. So these are kind of the big dogs right now. And then where we see and have seen really great opportunities for existing and new businesses to take advantage is with niche solventless products. There's a number of them out there and there's producers kind of all across the country that are building their brands and their businesses today on these. CBD and CBD rosin, uh, we're gonna talk about that. 
cartridges, the proliferation of true rosin cartridges is just going haywire going right, now. right now. There's, there's sure. so many of these high-end hash makers that are now starting to make cartridges. Uh, topicals and salves, that's another thing. You know, just having a product that is based in rosin that is solventless is immediately a differentiator that people can identify with and one that will, can also increase the price point of your product because it is a higher quality product to begin with. Yeah, and topicals and salves and edibles and stuff like that, your grams of concentrate, you know, it might not be a dabbable gram or something that you want to hit the shelf. Well, then you're able to take that type of product or even a second press rosin and really shift those into those type of products and that potency is going to go so much farther than selling one gram out of your jar. And you know, coming from my end of things, uh, working in marketing, talking with so many of our clients and kind of their marketing endeavors, you know, this is one of the most powerful tools you can give a marketing team. And your company is to say, this product is solventless. This product is full spectrum. This product it has these quality identifiers to it, whether or not it was made from a food grade rosin or not. So there's a lot more flexibility with solventless now than there was a year ago when we were giving this talk and we're seeing a lot more businesses a lot more of our customers you know really diversifying what they're doing with their material as they press it and turn it into a variety of different things yeah now more than ever setting yourself apart in this industry is exactly what you need to be able to make a stamp and a brand so just before i move on uh this picture again resolution not very good but Poplin Barkley, one of our biggest customers out in California, they've become famous for what they put out are mainly topicals. And I mean, they are one of our biggest customers. And the majority of what they do with their rosin is, is making topicals in California. I mean, that is the clearest example of a brand in an extremely competitive and difficult market. California is extremely tough to operate in right now using a food grade high quality rosin to make topicals and being extremely successful with it. So one small example, um, obviously really nice packaging doesn't hurt, but they do a really good job. Uh, another thing, CBD rosin. This is something that unlike ice water hash and sift is still very much in the mastery process. I think a lot of businesses are really trying to figure this out right now and a lot of people are interested. Um, this is farmhouse hemp. They're located in Fort Collins, Colorado. We did a video with them talking about that, but that they use rosin for all of their CBD products. Um, there are some issues depending on the concentrations, of course, uh, but using CBD rosin is again, a huge differentiator and there's a ton of things that you can put it into. It's not just selling a CBD yeah. gram. And within, you know, the old CBD and you know, you're pressing something, you're activating it next Y and Z. Well, you're just concentrating it. You know, that will happen whether you're distilling it or you're using ethanol or whether you're using solventless, you're going to end up having a higher concentration of THC in that product, which is going to make it uncompliant within, you know, the farm bill to be shipping. So what you do at that point is you end up mixing it into, you know, MCT oils or you end up making products themselves that because even if it has 1% THC in the overall concentrate after you've done, after you've made it, well, after you've diluted into that one ounce jar for that pet, now you're maybe 0.1% THC, and we're always allowed 0.3. Yep. Are there any products that you've seen on the CBD side that are particularly popular right now? I mean, pet products, tinctures, um, salves are probably one of the most popular that I've seen right now, um, just totally on the market. Mm -hmm. um, but pet products, you know, I feel like you know, anything, will, anybody will do anything for their pets, so. Yeah, definitely, I know I would. So another big thing that we really get a lot of questions about, and now we're gonna kind of lead into, you know, really actionable advice and items for your business or any business that you're planning on starting, is kind of explaining what yields with solventless look like and, and what they mean. So, and this thing is really shifting. So. <laughs> When you've got flour rosin, you're looking at ranges of 18% or above. And all of these ranges are what you can expect and what you should strive for with your business. Now, with ice water hash specifically, since we've been talking a lot about that, 
when we're talking four to eight percent, that's a fresh frozen product. That is a product that is about three quarters wet weight. We're not talking about a dry to a dry weight yield. We're talking exactly. about a wet product yielding into a final dry state. Yeah, so taking a frozen and a dry pound, basically your frozen pound will basically be like a quarter pound dry. So I always use the math of 75, 25 when you're talking about frozen weight. So when you're talking about frozen weight, four true frozen pounds equals one dry pound. So when you're doing your math and you do your numbers based on these numbers, it's actually pretty, it equals, you know, that 18% range compared to, you know, that four to eight percent. It's the same math, it's just a different volume of water within that, within that bud mass. Yep, and we're about to talk pretty heavily about genetics because that is gonna be one of the key factors here in how to achieve yields that are profitable for your business. And the way to really think about this is if you're trying to make a full melt product, you're trying to you know, capture the best trichomes you possibly can and sell that as a standalone product, what you would do as a business is wash that product very gently at first, and then you're going to go back and you're going to rewash it for a full spectrum. You're not just going to leave all of those trichomes in the bag and leave them behind. This is a multi-stage process to get multiple products out of a single strain or cultivar that you're working with so that again you can diversify the amount of products that you're actually selling here. Same goes for sift. You know, you might tumble what you've got very, very gently to make a really high quality sift that you're gonna press into your best sift rosin, and then you can continue sifting it, getting more out of it to create other products. Yep, and that's what I was talking about earlier, where then you take that stuff that you're not going to end up hitting the market with that is a what I call a dabbable concentrate and you're basically putting it in topicals, you're putting it in edibles, you're putting it in or distilling it. You know, you're doing all sorts of other post-processing to create it into a final, final consumable product. Yep. Yep. So with yield and solventless, it really comes more down to the types of plants that you're running and the types of strains that you're using. So with other types of extraction, sol you know, solvent-based extractions, one of the key questions we get asked all the time. You know, what, what really is the difference between a solvent and a solventless extraction process? Look, I'll, I'll take that on real quick. Please, um, he makes more of it. So, <laughs> so you got to look at a solvent process. So at the solvent process, we're liquefying all of the trichome heads. And so since we're liquefying, we're looking, liquefying them and then reclaiming that gas and leaving the THC and then purging, it, purging that gas off later in the post-processing. And so with solventless, what we're doing is we're basically stripping it with either ice water, you know, CO2, dry ice, or just tumbling it in itself, and, or just pressing it in itself. So we've got to be a little bit more delicate with it as well. And, you know, with solventless, you're stripping it, you're basically keeping it as a whole plant. So full melt, I'm sure you're all familiar, you have different micron screens. Well, at each different micron screen, you're going to have a different grade. And those different grades are going to create a different final product for you. And what it will allow you to do is stretch that solventless material that much further to create that many more SKUs to make your solventless business that much more viable. Right. Ultimately, what we are trying to do with solventless is isolate the resin glands intact and then create various products from those isolated trichomes. Whereas with solvent based, it's a dissolution process. Yep, it's exactly, very exactly. So you're just stripping it, you're liquefying it, and you're also taking a bunch of fats and lipids with it, where we're actually able to do, keep it more pure throughout that process. And as you, we get rougher with that process, we're able to you know, get that higher yield for topicals, edibles, all sorts of other different type of products. Yep. So. Sourcing proper material, whether you're growing it or purchasing it for your business, is one of, if not the most important steps to be successful with solventless. And I'm sure as people in here who have created solventless would know, you know, we talk to our customers and you know, sometimes they run tangy. Their cost per gram to produce it is they are they are losing money on that gram. Whereas with other ones, they're making a lot more. You know, if you're washing Mac or you have some of these other strains, your price per gram to wash and create that product, there's a giant range there. So being able to actually get material that's going to work for solventless is one of the most important steps here. And when you're vertically integrated, that gives you a lot of control because if your head grower 
is on board and actually looking for genetics that they know will do well and they're strain hunting, then that's really going to help you. Yeah, the lineage and the genetics, I mean, we'll get into a few strains and crosses and stuff like that. We have a list out of, you know, just some, you know, things to look out for, you know, as you're going out and buying seeds, as you're going out and, you know, buying clones from these different businesses, making sure that the lineage is there so that those trichome structures, which we have a slide here coming up that will show trichome structures and how full those trichome heads are and if they're just shells. Because when you look at a trichome head and if it's going to be full, you're going to end up you know, having a much higher yield in the solventless extraction process compared to if it's a shell, you just wash that away. When where, that's where you're going to have a half percent or a one percent and that's going to be more on your high, higher terpene of like tangy and those type of flavors. You want more chem type of flavor and, um, and crosses, cakes. Um, but yeah, we'll get into that in a little bit. Yeah. So what we like to tell people is that if you're growing your own, it's really important to identify strains that are going to work well. Like I said, we're just about to go into a whole bunch of crosses and strains that you can start hunting for yourself. Or if you're purchasing from a third party, you really need to make sure that they are aware that either this product has been washed in the past or this strain. You want to ask them, you know, can I get a little bit to do a test wash? Does the, is the grower aware that this may work well or not for solventless in the first place? There's a lot of questions right. that you can ask before you go all in on a batch that you're going to produce and turn it into rosin. Yeah, vet your grows um, and vet your sourcing material. That is probably the best advice I can give each and every one of you. Um, you know, buy test washes, you know, buy three pounds of each strain that they're growing in X, Y, and Z and, you know, see how they do in each different type of solventless process. And then that gives you data and then it also gives you partners. You know, they're able to rely on you, you're able to rely on them. And you have this nice symbiotic relationship where you, they are learning how you want it to become to your facility, how you want it packed, how many increments, all of those things are going to lead you to a very, very successful business. Yep. So just a slide here on the different tri some of the different trichome structures and what they look like. Uh, across the top, even though it's a little hard to read, you know, that's so small, it's a spike, 20, it's going to go pretty much straight through your bag. And there's a lot of hemp strains, actually, that those are the types of trichomes kind of atop the, cross, the, the top row there that you're going to see that are common in certain CBD strains, which is why they can be really hard to wash. Whereas with you know D here in the bottom left corner, that is pretty much your ideal trichome structure for pressing the rosin, washing, or sifting because it's large enough to be captured well and it's, it's got a large glandular head. Yeah, and it's full. You know, you're going to see a lot of trichome heads. You might be able to see those trichome heads underneath the microscope, but it might be empty. And even if you see that trichome head shape, it's got to be full. Otherwise, you're not going to end up having a successful yield of, on your solventless material. Yep. So with many of our most successful customers, how they've gotten that way is by being relentless and detail-oriented about how they select the material and the strains that they choose to run through solventless so that they can increase their yields and increase their chance of success. You know, getting a jeweler's loop, looking at the plant, seeing where the trichomes are, how big they are, what kinds they are. You know, it's, it's that attention to detail that will make the biggest difference in selecting genetics that you can really be profitable on, really build your brand on, and get connoisseurs and influencers, you know, behind your brand online for your solventless products. So. Here are some strains. Uh, Take a picture, we're happy to send this out. I mean, this will be on Shaping Fires podcast. And yeah, we can put it on our website. Put it on our website. This, this is not and, yeah. secret information, no, no, no. but these are some of the strains that we see with many of our customers and some of the biggest hash makers online that the cultivars and the lineages associated with many of these are so popular and they yield so well that they deserve special attention and you know kind of like we have a note at the bottom here i mean there's so many great breeders that come to this show and sell their stuff uh, a lot of breeders are now really really trying to make strains specifically for rosin and solventless um, josh and, and has had yeah, some pretty incredible yeah. results with a couple of these at his own lab um, eric simpson who's with us in the audience told us that he had a record-breaking wash of nine percent on a related strain 
So, you know, the, the possible, yeah, sitting right over there. So, <laughs> these are some really great strains to start with. Now, a caveat here is that just because you pop a chem dog seed, <laughs> does not guarantee that that strain specifically is, you know, going to yield 5 6% in your wash. That, that's not what that means. But that these are generally lineages and cultivars that have proper trichome structure and that have the best shot at being able to give you a bud structure, a trichome structure, and the terpene profile yeah. that's going to play nice with solvent extraction. Exactly, and this is the thing you also have to think about. If you're fully integrated and you're going to be growing, these are the genetics and stuff that you're going to want to be sourcing and buying. Um, because it also not only is going to give you a versatile product, but it's going to give the MIPS or whatever, what lab, say you have an influx of material, you're able to sell that as solventless material and hydrocarbon material. You're, it doesn't limit you one route or the other. Now you're probably getting 25, 50 bucks more per pound, you know, just because you got a versatile product. And also you're going to end up with clients and, you know, you're going to end up with crosses. And, you know, I, in our video that we did together, uh, you know, we talked about artisan blends where you end up having two, you grew it completely separate and then you mix it up into the washing process to make, you know, a very interesting terpene profile like uh, the punch drunk that we put out at um, yeah. You know, some uh, and essential yeah, extracts you know, used to do that very well too yeah. when they were around here. So, yep, it's keys to being successful. Um, you know, as you're sourcing material, purchasing seeds, and you know, definitely keep that in mind. Yep. So again, keeping an eye on the genetics. Uh, you know, many hash makers and growers are really proud of the products that they put out, as they should be, and they are not shy about what kinds of strains are working well for them. So, highly suggest going out, you know, following hash makers on Instagram that are making solventless, being successful with it. They're always talking about the new strains that they're running. Um, they're not going to give you a cut of it. I can pretty much guarantee that. But you but should you can definitely see hunt it. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Or find a clone store who has a similar one. You know, cookies and cream is a huge one. The cream crosses. Uh, ice cream, uh, just on this list alone, uh, GMO, MAC, the cake, and the chem dog crosses and lineages are by far my favorite on this list. And will do you really, really well. Uh, you know, hit that, you know, 8 9%. There, there's a lot of good options here. Um, we've been told that roughly a quarter to a third of phenotypes and strains out there are going to be in that profitable yield range for what you're doing. So, it's not every single one, but there's more of them than people expect. Absolutely. Cool. So here's a really, really big one. You know, once we've kind of gone through the idea of what kind of SKUs you're thinking about making and whether you're you know, an MSO, a multi-state operator looking to install the same lab in multiple states, or you're a boutique grower who is just building your brand around a core line of solventless products, uh, really thinking about your lab space is one of the best things that you can do for yourself early on in the process. I mean, it can be very exciting to, like, yeah, man, we're gonna buy a rosin press, and we're gonna get in there, we're gonna squish this shit, it's gonna be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you can make a solventless lab be very successful in under a thousand square feet. And we see people, and they are making their rosin in a closet, and they are winning awards with it. So Absolutely. square footage is, one of the smallest concerns, but planning against it is one of the most important things you can do. So yeah, streamlining your floor, spent, floor space and you know, really making sure that it's optimized for what you guys are really doing at your lab is important. So figuring out the SKUs, not only that you want to produce in the future, but that you're going to be releasing when you go to market or the SKUs that you have in the market. Um, those, all of those things have to be factored into place before you say, I'm going to go put that rouse and press on that table and set the freeze dryer up here and the wash machine over there. You know, because that includes plumbing, that includes, you know, there's a lot of little things that will make your life a lot easier if you put things in the right spots. Yep. And for anyone who is considering getting into this or already is and is looking to upgrade like we are talking about at the very beginning, if you have questions about, you know, how many freeze dryers do I really need or how much space do I need to plan against, that's something that we can actually help you guys out with. And those are some of the most popular questions that we get asked on a daily basis is, you know, I've got X amount of material that I'm trying to wash a week. You know, what do I really need? How do I really lay out my space? How do I lay out my lab design? Um, and, and we've become, you know, pretty much the top dogs in, in helping labs build and, and grow out with that. So, yep. happy to help there. Um, anything else you want to add on this? No. Cool.
All right. So we're gonna leave you know a good 10 to 15 minutes here for Q and A since the last time when we do presentations it went way over that and they had to kick us off the stage. So we've got some predictions here that we're expecting for 2020 and beyond just based on the trends and speaking with our customers. Uh, rosin cartridges are coming in hot. People are really excited about this product. It's not available in that many markets yet, uh, but now businesses are, are really starting to see that if I master my solventless process, uh, a cartridge is a product that is the luxury cart. It is, it is the top of the line product that your business can sell pretty much that's gonna appeal to the widest range of consumers. So that's gonna be huge. Um, do you want to add something to that? No. I mean, I think it's going to be one of the bigger things that we're going to see in 2020. Um, you know, and it will take you know some time you know to get your business there to be launching you know all sorts of carts, all sorts of you know hash rods, and you know it is a learning process um, and sourcing the right material to be coming out with these exotic SKUs. Yep. So there's a lot of businesses coming out in Colorado with it, and really the progression is you know mastering the hash rosin, mastering the sip rosin, and then doing the R and D to create a product like this. And I mean, it's crazy. We're talking seventy to ninety dollars for a half gram of these type of cartridges. So very high price points. Um, and then niche solventless products like we were talking about before: CBD rosin, topicals, edibles, especially uh, a major new opportunity. There's just not a lot of businesses out there that are promoting that and that are using those products and the solvent list as a differentiator to do so. But now that, but now people are really picking up on that as competition is increasing. People are looking for different ways to differentiate themselves in the market. Uh, these are gonna be products you're gonna start seeing a lot more of. Um, and then many more labs that are not doing solventless processing are starting to realize how much they're missing out on by not competing in the first place. So we're getting a lot of calls and a lot of people are coming to us saying, you know, hey, I've been thinking about this for a long time or, you know, I'm just not really sure if this is going to work for me, but all of my guys in the lab, like, will not shut up about it. They will not stop asking me when, when we're going to start releasing rosin. So we're seeing a lot of these businesses really starting to come out of the woodworks and realizing that you know this is an area to compete in. Um, there's yeah. a lot there. I mean, you don't need a, you know a thousand square feet. You could do, start with 500, you know, or and then move up to a thousand square feet. Or you know, if you have al extra allocated space, I mean, the cost to get into solventless extraction or add it to your business and add all of those SKUs. I mean, I can guarantee you six months down the road, if you did you know, half of what we said on here, you're going to have an extra three to six SKUs released, and the, all those hundreds of sub stores that you're already in are going to start to pick those up. And then those invoices just kind of keep going up and up and up. Yeah. Cool. So the last thing we'll close with here before we go into the Q&A is, you know, from my perspective and from speaking with many of our customers, it, it's hard to understate how big of a brand builder solventless can be. And in a really, really flooded market with cannabis products, having your brand be something that people recognize on the shelf, whether it's through your packaging, you know, really through the quality of your product, that these are the kinds of products that people are really talking about, and, and especially the influencers. I mean, I, I just cannot understate that enough. Um, and that's how some of these big brands like Cushmasters, you know, having come out, won an award, now, you know, people talk about it on Instagram all the time. Like, that is free advertising for your business, uh, and, and the value cannot be understated. Yeah, no, exactly. Cool. cool. Let's get some questions. So that's it. <laughs> Could you share a mic with Josh? Sure. So we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Go ahead and raise your hand, and uh, we'll get right to it. Oh, right in right here. We can enlarge you may have already talked about the equipment that you're using, and if so, I apologize. Uh, but you did mention the uh, freeze dryers. That's the only thing I picked up on. Yeah, so uh, pure pressure equipment. You know, we have everything from, you know, solventless equipment to freeze dryers to sift equipment. Um, you know, we're basically a one-stop shop for, you know, all the solventless products that you would need. Um, and we try and source everything you know, that is going to end up coming with certs, go doing all sorts of different, you know, and help you build your business. And it's also about, we kind of touched on this earlier, about industry specific equipment. We built, designed all of this equipment from the ground up and made it functional from the ground up to make sure that this solventless is viable. Because five years ago, 
you know, it really wasn't. Um, and it wasn't being talked about because you couldn't do it on a commercial scale. Well, now you can. And now it's, you know, really one of the highest quality, highest price point things on shelves today. Yeah, and after this, if you'd like, you know, with our booth at 411, um, if you want to come by, we'd be happy to talk with you about just the different options and, and what kind of equipment you need. And it's really all based on what your processing needs are. So it, every business is going to need a different solution, and, and that's really the approach that we take. I know you showed uh, kind of the percentages that you're coming out, but just straight away, unlike an average kind of run that you're kind of seeing, mm -hmm. from fresh frozen yep. to your grade A hash rosin, yep. one and a half percent, two percent, what do you really think that the average kind of is? Right. And I know there's monsters that dump, I know there's yeah. X factors. Yeah. You want to take that one? Yeah. So to rosin, um, I mean, you're looking at around 3% to rosin on your average, uh, you know, frozen and, you know, you'll have those dumpers that are going to offset you and, you know, create it because, yes, there is loss in each post processing that you do, which will then determine your yield at your finished product. Um, but then through that, it's the, also those byproducts that we were talking about earlier from that post processing that you're able to extend and save and create that many more SKUs that now you, it wasn't a loss. Yeah. You see what I mean? Is that what's going into the carts, kind of like the BC grade stuff? No, no the I highest think. quality yeah. is really going into the carts and that's, uh, you know, partly the tricky part and why you don't see as much of them on the market. Yeah. For uh, states that have just gone medical or states like Illinois or uh, Missouri, yeah. Have you seen any problem with uh, production of fresh fresh frozen and like the supply of fresh frozen uh, not being adequate? Yeah, I, I think the supply is an issue in some newer states because as markets mature is what we've seen pretty much consistently across the board is that you know smokable flour is the dominant product when a market launches because people have not had access to this you know it, before other than buying it on the street or from friends or whatever it is. So. Getting fresh frozen product can be a challenge for some businesses in emerging markets, but I think some of these markets are starting to leapfrog each other, whereas a couple years ago, you could barely buy it in some of the emerging markets, but then now in Illinois, you know, things are getting more sophisticated, and that people who are coming to shows like these, going to the trade shows and learning things, are thinking like, okay, well, smokable flour is going to be big today. But in five months from now, I know that I need to get a great source of fresh frozen so I can be washing and making these kinds of products. Yeah. Um, that. As that trend goes down and as that price point goes down as well, like we were talking earlier, you know, in that market, more people will convert because there won't be as much of a demand for dry flour. They'll convert it to fresh frozen and then you'll see an increase in fresh frozen. And, you know, it's kind of like Colorado now where, you know, you can get fresh frozen all the time or you can get dry material all the time. Um, and it's just about the way the market sits and the, how all of these grows set up their business for, you know, whether it was that frozen model or that dry material model. And you'll see a lot of these dry material models start to change um, and start to go to fresh frozen as that price point drops. Um, have you seen anybody um, take the washed material um, and then process it with solvents after? So, you know, either dry the material and then you know, throw out the CO2 machine or a, a, a hydrocarbon machine? And if so, what's the best way to get that material prepped to run in those pieces of equipment after? Absolutely, and I mean, if you have a giant facility, I mean, it's totally doable. Um, but once you actually factor in the profitability on the material, what you made on it, and, and you, if you utilized it all, you know, it's not necessarily worth it and the labor that it's going to take to be able to re-extract it, dry it, you know. Um, you're going to have a lot of moisture in it if you don't re-dry it after you just washed it. Um, and then you have ice to melt, you know, there, there's, there's definitely problems with it. There, you know, could be down the line some machines that, you know, will do that, but you would be having around a 2%, 3% yield. I mean, you look at solvent extraction, when you re, um, you know, don't you know solvent over it after you've just extracted it again you're looking at a three percent yield or less out the door and then you know it's basically waste material at that point it, we have heard of some people taking that approach but like Josh said it's, it's very uncommon because once you actually total up the labor it, it ends up really digging into what you can do with it what most places are doing is doing 
again, multiple washes on the same material to start, you know, with that 3%, which really dry weight is 12%. <laughs> to getting that A grade hash product and then washing again into more of a full spectrum, into more of a food grade and just getting everything out of it so that your actual yield on your first grade, you know, it might be that 3%, but the total yield for, you know, these more sophisticated extractors is going to be a lot higher than that or at least a bit higher than that by re-extracting it, but through solving these ways. Yep. Yep. All right. This will be our last question. Uh, is there any like tricks that you do in your grow to tell what's gonna wash better? Uh, any like ways of, you know, kind of something super greasy, is it gonna wash well? Is it not gonna wash well? Or what's like any tips or tricks you can uh, see from that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start. I'm sure Josh has some really good input on this. Um, again, one of the tips that I talked about in the beginning that we've heard from a lot of places, and I'm sure Josh does as well, is, you know, using magnifying glasses and other magnification technology to look at the trichomes beforehand and you can even you know brush your finger on something and see how well they detach because detachability of your trichome heads is a really important thing to figure out uh, what a lot of places do is also a, a very small test wash so you could even i mean I, there's people that have done this i think ken wall was one who put some info out that most recently was just you know putting some in a jar and letting some of the trichomes just naturally separate and then seeing how they settle and really eyeballing it and seeing like you know how much is in my jar right now does this look like a lot does this look like a little you know if you're doing a test wash there's a lot of things that you can figure out before you're committing you know tens of thousands of fresh frozen grams to actually doing it yeah and i mean it's basically test washing all of your genetics and looking at those trichome heads are keys, but you know, starting with genetics that you know are phenos that are gonna wash well. Um, and you know, you're gonna have maybe 14 seeds in, of that genetic that you washed and you can wash those trichome head structures, you can wash all those phenos and then you can decide, okay, this one was a dumper, this structure looked really good, you know, it's healthy, that's the, those are the three that I wanna go into my grow moving forward. Um, that's gonna be, the keys to dialing in your grow. Yeah. Definitely trial and error. <laughs> Test watches will help. Yeah. Right on, that is all of our time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Jack Buckley, 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 Jack Buckley